Hi, Integrated Math One. Welcome to lesson 4.1.2a. Day one of determining the better measure of center and spread for a data set. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at a few things. We've got a couple goals. We have a couple goals. So we're going to calculate and interpret the mean and median of a data set. These are kinds of uh, what we'll refer to as a measure of central tendency. So when we're finding the mean, we've mentioned before, that's finding the average, add them all up, find out how many there are. We'll find the median where we list everything off in order, and then the median's the guy in the middle, right? We pluck that out. So those are measures of central tendency. We'll be calculating and interpreting those. We're also going to determine which of them is best to use for a data set because we're going to see that sometimes our data is a little skewed. So we'll talk about which is the better measure to use when that happens, mean or median. Um, we'll calculate and interpret the interquartile range of a data set, IQR. It's actually really easy to find. You will not be disappointed. And we're going to use that interquartile range to determine whether or not our data set has any outliers in it. And we'll talk about outliers and what they are in a bit. So we have lots of key terms. In case you missed that, there's a ton of key terms going on today. So statistics, measure of central tendency, intercordial range, data distribution, outlier, lower fence, upper fence. There's a lot of key terms going on today. So you've displayed and interpreted data sets using the statistical process, right? We made box and whisker plots. We made histograms. We made dot plots, right? All of these things, you've done this, and we've looked at it and used it to help us interpret our data. But how can we further describe a data set using things like the center of our data and the shape of our data and how spread out is our data? These are also very important things. So I'd like you to take just a moment to consider each data display. Here I have a dot plot of the heights of home team basketball players. I have a histogram of the amount of grocery purchases by customer. And I also have daily rainfall amounts for Seattle in April of 2017. So there you go. So without doing any calculations, just no calculations at all, predict whether the mean or the median will be greater for the data set represented by each display. Remember, median's the one in the middle. Mean is what you get by adding them all up and dividing by how many there are. So, um, and you can indicate your prediction by marking where you think the median is going to be and where you think the, me the mean is going to be on each one of these. Um, and ex and uh, explain why. Yeah. Go ahead and hit pause. Is it better to use the, is the mean going to be greater or the median? Go ahead and hit pause. Take a look at these and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. They're practicing outside. In case you can't hear, they're cheering on the runners going by right behind outside my classroom. So you may get a little bit of that here today. So let's take a look at this first one. I can see that most of my data is bunched up over here to the right, but I can see a few being pulled off to the left. So that means if I were to pick the one in the middle, it would probably be pulled a little bit to the left. Uh, Oh, pardon me, it probably be pulled a little bit to the right. I think, I think, I think the median, if I were to pick up the number in the middle, it's going to lean a little right here, isn't it? Um, if I were to line these up in order, probably going to lean a little to the right. I think my median is going to be greater than my mean than if I add them all up and divide by how many there are. Histogram, it's pretty, pretty central, but it is, looks like, my numbers are a little heavy on the left, doesn't it? So again, though, I do think my median is going to be greater than my mean. I could be wrong about that. We'll play with this in a little bit. Um, daily rainfall amounts. Wow, this is heavy on the left, and it's very, very light on the right side. So you know what? But there's some big numbers here. I think my mean is going to be greater than the median. And again, I could be wrong about these. We're just kind of predicting based on the way this is going. Um, you can notice, especially with this dot plot and with our box and whisker plot, the data is kind of leaning to one side or the other, isn't it? We're going to talk about that. 
we're going to talk about that. But before we do, when we're analyzing a data set um, and describing the numerical characteristics of our data set, we call that statistics. And that's what statistics are. We're describing the characteristics of our set of data. That's it. Um, a statistic that describes the center of a data set is called a measure of central tendency. And a measure of central tendency is the numerical value used to describe the overall clustering of the data in a set. So two measures of central tendency that are typically used to describe a set of data are the mean, oh, I need my pen, are the mean and the median. So you're used to using those, right? Add them all up, figure out and divide by how many there are to get a rough idea of the average, a rough idea of the center of your data. And of course, the other is that median. We said median is when you line them all up in order from least to greatest and you pick out the one in the middle, that's your median. Also, another way of finding the center of your data. So we call these measures of central tendency. Now, both of these are found in a slightly different way. So they can sometimes produce different answers. So a gym surveys, by the way, we're on page 4-19 if you're not sure. A gym surveys its members about the average number of hours they spend at the gym each week. And the data are recorded in the dot plot shown. So here I have this. Um, so, so we have one person that does two hours a week at the gym. We've got three people that do five hours a week at the gym. One person that does six hours a week, another that does seven hours a week, another that does nine hours a week at the gym, 10 hours a week at the gym. We got three people that do 12 hours a week at the gym. That feels like a lot. Um, and one person that does 14 hours a week at the gym. But look at this. Look at this. Who's that? Seriously? Who is that? We've got somebody with a gym membership spending 32 hours a week at the gym. It's almost a full-time job. Person's probably pretty ripped at this point, I hope. I should say nice things about that person because they're probably heck of buff and could hurt me. Um, so to describe the mean of a data set, we're going to calculate X bar. Now, don't freak out when you see X bar. When you see X bar, that just means you're talking about the mean, okay? You're just going to find the average. So this is just a notational thing. Instead of writing out the word mean or writing out the word average, we will often just use X bar. So we can find the mean, the average the X bar of all of this data. And it's not hard to do. You know how to do it. You add it all up. We use a little summation symbol. We add them all up and then we divide by how many there are. So for example, if I have 5, 10, 9, 7, and 5, I would add those up, 5 plus 10 plus 9 plus 7 plus 5, and I could do that in my calculator, 5 plus 10 plus 9 plus 7 plus 5, and I would get 36. And then we divide by how many there are, the number of data values. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so we'll divide that by 5. And 36 divided by 5 gives us 7.2. So the mean of this data set is 7.2. Again, you did this a whole bunch in middle school, so that's not really a surprise. The median of a data set, uh, to, deter to determine, uh, describe the median of a data set, you need to find the middle number. Now, please remember that the values have to be placed in order from least to greatest. So like if we come back to this right here, 5, 10, 9, 7, and 5. Well, I need to put them in order, least to greatest. I've got two fives, I've got a 7, a 9, and a 10. If I wanted the median, I would look for the number in the exact middle. That's it, right there. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Sometimes I like to use my fingers and like count out, like do, 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 right, to find my median. It's like a thing. So there's my median. Except I can't spell. Oh no. So in this case, my median would be seven because if I put my numbers in order from least to greatest, seven is in the middle. So my mean is 7.2, but my median is seven. So note that they're not exactly the same. They're both trying to measure the center of my data, but they did it differently, which is why I have slightly different numbers. 
So can you take a look at our gym membership? I would like you to take a look at our gym membership. And I would like you to start by calculating the five number summary for the data. Remember minimum, maximum, median out of the middle, and then our first quartile was the middle of the lower half, our third quartile was the middle of the upper half, all right? So find our calculator five number summary. And then what I want you to do is right on top of this on your book, just up above it, put your box and whisker plot up on top, up above it, okay? Go ahead, hit pause, see what you can do with this, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So the first thing I need to do is I need to put my data, list out my data. That's gonna work better. So I have one person that did two. I've got three fives. Uh, I've got somebody with six. I've got somebody at seven. Uh, I've got somebody at nine, somebody who did 10. I have three people at 12, 12, 12, 12. I've got a person at 14. And then we have our guy on the end or gal spending 32 hours a week at the gym. I still have so many questions there. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick things off, right? Okay, so there's my minimum. I know that, there's my minimum. All right, cool. Here's my maximum. Sweet. I'm making a mess of this, sorry. So there's my maximum, Hazan, happy day. Now, be careful counting your way toward the middle. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that didn't work. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it's gonna be the nine. One, two, three, four, five, six. It is, there it is. So there's my median. Now, we know these, we've done these before. The new ones are the quartiles, right? Quartiles are new. So if you recall, the quartile is the middle of the bottom half. So if I take a look here, it looks like the middle of my bottom half is this five, isn't it? So that's my first quartile. And then of course the, uh, oh my goodness, I'm having issues here. Um, the middle of my upper half is gonna be my third quartile. So it looks like, if I count out here, it looks like it's right there. Yeah, looks like that's my third quartile, sweet. All right, we have our five number summary, which means we can make our box and whisker plot. And I told you just to make it above this. So I've got a minimum at two, so make a little mark at two. My first quartile is at five, so make a little mark here. My median is at nine, let's make a mark there. My third quartile is 12, so that's gonna go right there. And my maximum is 32. The Roared Rage guy all the way up here. Remember that for these guys in the middle, we, this is where our box is. This is where our box is. It's half of our data, right? Half of our data is sitting in that box. And then whiskers on the end. Whew. All right, we made our box and whisker plot. It's not hard. It just takes time to like organize all your junk, right? Right, am I right? Yeah. All right, what I'd now like you to do is calculate the mean of the data. All right, take all these numbers from earlier. I want you to calculate up the mean, add them all up, divide by how many there are. And then when you find it, can you do a little X bar above that point on the number line? Go ahead and hit pause, calculate your mean, do your X bar, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I already listed off these numbers, and so I realized that I had 15, uh, pardon me, 13 of them. So I went ahead and I added them all up. I already had them written out. So I added all of them up, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 of them. That's very convenient for me. So I went ahead, I added them up, I got 131, I divided that by 13, and I got about 10.1 roughly. So I'm gonna go ahead, let's see, 13 is here. So 13.1 will be like, just like past that. Wow, I'm oh, sorry, 10.1, my apologies. 10.1 will be just past it right about there. 
Um, do you notice anything about how your data is clustered? Hit pause, jot down your thoughts, hit play to check your work and keep the discussion going. So me personally, I noticed that most of my data was like clustered around here. Like most of my data was between like five and 14, right? I mean, there's the one person that only does two hours a week at the gym. That person might be me. And then, you know, most people are not doing 32 hours a week at the gym, though we have somebody. So most of my data is kind of clustered between 5 and 14. And there is that one extreme value at 32. Um, we kind of have two peaks. Maybe you noticed that. Maybe you noticed we had like a peak at 5 and a peak at 12. So maybe you wrote that down too. I don't know. But it gives us this kind of weird shape, right? The overall shape of a graph is called the data distribution. Now, there are three common types of data distribution, okay? You have pictures of it in your book, which we'll look at in a second. It can be skewed left, skewed right, and symmetric. The distribution of data can help you determine whether the mean or the median is a better measure of center. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to come back here um, and come back here. Right here's our little X bar. And here's our box and whisker plot. I have all this junk on here. Hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to erase all this. Um, and we said 10.1. Here's 10.1. It would be like X bar. That was where our median was. You can see that my mean is a little more than my median, right? Here's my mean, here's my median. It's a little bit more than that. But I can also see that most of my data is over here. There's just this value that's pulling it to the right. So when that happens, when you've got some value that's pulling it off to the right like that, we say it's skewed right. And our mean ends up being more than our median. So when it's skewed to the right, I've got some random value off to the right that's pulling on it. It's called skewed right, and it throws off my mean, right? When it's skewed right, the mean of a data set is greater than the median. That's just what happens. So the median is the best measure of central tendency because the median, I mean, we're just picking up a number. It really doesn't get pulled on by that weird extreme value very much. But the mean really gets a tug with that extreme value. So if we have something pulling to the right, if we've got something that's like pulling it off to the right, then that means that we're going to use the median. It's going to be a better measure. If my data is nice and symmetrical, it's kind of clumped in the middle and it kind of tapers off on both sides, then we say it's symmetric. And it doesn't matter whether you use the mean or the median. They're both going to be pretty good measures. If you have an extreme value on the left, so you've got an extreme value pulling your data set off to the left, then we say that it is skewed left. There's something, there's some extreme value on the left that's yanking that way. And again, the mean of the data set now becomes less than the median of the data set. The median, again, is going to be the better measure of central tendency. When I've got an extreme value pulling things off to the left, the mean really is affected by that. But the median, meh, not so much. So the median is a better measure of central tendency. Whether it's skewed right or skewed left, the median is going to be a better measure of central tendency. If it's symmetric, you can use either one. I tend to like the mean. So looking at our gym hours and looking at our box and whisker plot that we made earlier, which measure of central tendency would you choose to represent the data set? And don't forget to tell me why. Go ahead, hit pause, write it down, hit play to check your work. So I don't know about you guys, but this thing is pulling to the right. Do you see that? Do you see this crazy extreme value that's being pulled to the, pulling things to the right? So this whole thing is skewed right. And because it's skewed right, guys, that means I need to use the median. Um, I would use the median to represent the data set because the data are skewed right. 
right? This crazy extreme values like tugging, making weird things happen. Don't like that. Um, the value of 30, uh, the value 32 is way greater than the other values, and it really does affect the mean. Yeah. Um, another characteristic to consider when analyzing a graphical display is what we refer to as the spread or variability, variability, I got that, of the data. So how spread out is your data, right? We found the center, yay, whether we use the mean or the median, we found the center. But how spread out is our data from the center? That's also something we want to keep in mind, right? So one common measure of spread is the interquartile range. And we don't like writing interquartile range over and over and over again, so we will often abbreviate it as IQR. The interquartile range measures how far the data are spread out from the median. And it's just calculated by subtracting your quartiles, third quartile to the first quartile. In fact, on a box and whisker plot, the interquartile range is the box. Yeah, it's just from first quartile to third quartile, how far is it? So if we subtract quartile three, I would do quartile three minus quartile one, we'll find our, our IQR interquartile range. And that just tells us how spread out things are from the median. So if the median is a better measure of center to use, so our data is skewed and we're like, oh, we should use the median, then the IQR, the interquartile range, should be used to describe spread. IQR goes with the median. They, they come as a set. They come as a match set. So a box and whisker plot, really useful for this. So we're back to our lovely question, our lovely box and whisker plot. Calculate the IQR, the interquartile range of the data. Go ahead and hit pause, work it out, hit play when you're ready to check your work. So we said the interquartile range was the box, right? I'm gonna do my third quartile minus my first quartile. So fine, my third quartile is 12. My first quartile is five. So 12 minus five is seven. I have an interquartile range of seven. That means that all of my data is, like half of my data is within seven units there, isn't it? My gosh. Now, another useful statistic when analyzing data is to determine if there are any outliers. You might think of them as the extreme ones, okay? It is important to identify outliers because outliers can affect the other statistics of our data set, right? It could such as the mean. Oh my gosh, we've already seen how those outliers, those extreme values, will totally affect our mean. So it is important to identify those. There is a way to actually calculate an outlier. An outlier is typically calculated by multiplying your interquartile range, your IQR, by 1.5. And then determining if there are any data values, um, if any data values are greater or lesser than the calculated distance away from quartile one or quartile three. Let, let, me, let me see if I can explain this better. So you're gonna take your interquartile range, you're gonna multiply by 1.5. That's what calculators are for, super easy, no problem. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna do your first quartile and subtract what you just got, right? Your interquartile range like you multiply by 1.5. We call this the lower fence. I know it's written in your book, but I think the way it's written, it might be easier if I write it here just so you can see it. Okay. I'm going to grab another color. And then we have another side, right? We got two sides of this box and whisker plot, so we have two sides of the fence. So then we say that for the other, core, for the other fence, we'll do our third quartile, and we will add that interquartile range times 1.5. And we're going to call this the upper fence. The deal is all of your values should be inside those fences, all right? We keep everybody in the fences. That's where they belong. If you have a value that's lower than your lower fence or greater than your upper fence, uh, that's an outlier, okay? Are we getting the idea? So you're going to multiply your IQR by 1.5. You'll subtract it from your first quartile and add it to your third quartile to find your fences. If they're in the fences, they're fine. 
Anything lower than the lower fence or higher than the upper fence, that's an outlier. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this problem that we've been working on. Um, our lovely gym problem, right? Here's our gym problem. So we did our five number summary. We did our box and whisker plot, huzzah, huzzah. We found um, the IQR. So here's what we're going to do. Now that we found that our IQR is seven, let's calculate our lower fence. So for the lower fence, we said that was our quartile one minus our IQR times 1.5. So fine. We know what our first quartile is. We did that earlier. It's five. And in fact, if we forgot, it's on the box and whisker plot, right? We have it right here. Minus, well, we said our interquartile range was seven times 1.5, always times 1.5. And then I'm just going to use a calculator. Seven times 1.5 is 10.5. So five minus 10.5. And if I do 5 minus 10.5, I get negative 5.5. And we don't have anybody over there, but that's okay. So here's my box and whisker plot, and my lower fence is all the way down at negative 5.5. So here's my lower fence. There it is, just a little bit. There's my fence. It's not a very good fence, is it? Let's calculate our upper fence. So for our upper fence... For my upper fence, we said we need to do the third quartile plus my IQ, I can't even, IQR. I've made a mess of this times 1.5, sorry. We already know our third quartile, we found that earlier, it was 12. And we're going to add, we already did 7 times 1.5. If you want to do it again, you can. You don't have to because we already did it. Um, we said that that was 10.5. And if I add those together, I get 22.5. So here's the top, uh, here, here we, I'm going to kind of move this over and be like, okay, 22.5, there's my upper fence. Take a look at your values. Do I have anything less than negative 5.5? Nah, that's okay. So no outliers on the low end. Do I have anything greater than 22.5? Um, yes. <laughs> Holy crud, right? The dude doing 32 hours a week at the gym. That is way past our upper fence. So that means it's an outlier. So now that we figured out, we're like, oh, crud, 32 is greater than that. That's an outlier. What we do is we put a little asterisk there. And we make the next number down, in this case 14, we'll make the next number down our new maximum. So now my new five number summary is two, five, eight, 12, and 14. If we take that outlier out, look how nice and symmetrical our box and whisker plot becomes. Ooh, schnazzy. You know what's interesting though, is it didn't really um, change our interquartile range, did it? Because if we still do third quartile minus first quartile, it's still 12 minus 5, it's still 7. So our inner quartile range wasn't really affected by the outlier. Um, that may not always be true. It was true this time. I don't know if it will always be true. But in this case, um, yeah, it really didn't affect our median all that much or our inner quartile range. So even though we had the weird outlier, it really didn't hit our median or interquartile range. And that's why we like to use them if our data is skewed. I've got another whole problem here. I don't think we're going to worry about this problem. If you're dying, if you're dying, you're welcome to hit pause at any point in this and play with it and take a look at it. But I think we've got the feel for this, um, all these lovely outliers and how to calculate them. It's a cool trick. As always, guys, I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found this useful. If you got questions or concerns, let me know. I'll be around, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.